of the UE Cave Hill campus, Mr. Julian Rogers, distinguished guest speaker, Mrs. Goodwin Rogers, and Claire Haynes, Dr. Henderson Carter, Department of History and Philosophy, the head, and chair of the 60th Anniversary Planning Committee, Mr. Noel Wood, Chief Executive Officer, the Nation Group of Companies, Ms. Carol Martindale, Editor-in-Chief, Nation News, Mr. Anthony Green, General Manager, Starcom Network, Mr. Ronnie Clark, Program Director, Starcom Network, Mr. Sherwood McCaskey, and Ms. Nadia Foster, representatives of the Caribbean Broadcasting Cooperation, Dr. Allison Leacock, Chair of the National Training Institute Initiative, my apologies, Members of senior management and staff of the University of the West Indies, specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, both in this physical space and online, welcome. Thank you for choosing to be a part of this event, the seventh lecture in the Legacy Lecture Series, jointly supported by the Nation Publishing Company and the Cave Hill Campus of the University of the West Indies. It is an impressive name, Legacy, because it's both a memory and a wish. Legacy speaks to the value we hold to what has been accomplished, gained, protected, and to the potential and promise we believe can occur for the future. Legacy requires the capacity to treasure the past and revere the future. And its significance is best understood within community, which is why we are gathered as such this evening. In bringing together two institutions, but also the communities that allow these institutions to hold up what has been accomplished and to look toward the future. Therefore, I'm grateful to have representatives of these institutions, Dr. Tara Innes, Senior Lecturer in History at the Cave Hill Campus, and Mr. Noel Wood, CEO of the Nation Group of Companies, to share a few remarks at the opening of this lecture. So let us please welcome firstly, Dr. Innes to the podium to give her remarks. All protocol having been established, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you all to the University of the West Indies 60th Anniversary Leg Legacy Lecture Series. Tonight is the culmination of a partnership between the UWI, Cave Hill Campus, and the Nation Publishing Company. Over the course of this lecture series, where we have heard about many of the contributions the university has made to Barbados and the region, as well as the critical perspectives the institution has brought to bear on issues and challenges facing many of our societies in the 21st century. We have had the, very, the, we've, we have had the great honor to work with the Nation Publishing Company, which is celebrating its own 50th anniversary this year, and I think that's all deserving of a, a round of applause. And we have now worked together to bring you a special lecture focused on the evolution of media in Barbados and the Caribbean. This appraisal comes at an important juncture in the information age. At one time, technology offered a lot of promise for wider distribution of the news and events shaping our world. Now, in the age of social media, we are battling the onslaught of misinformation and disinformation, which are being used to manipulate minds and sway opinions, and worse yet, actually influence our behaviors and actions in negative ways. And now we stand on a precipice, looking out at really what is an abyss of uncertainty that generative artificial intelligence, or AI, represents. As academics here at the university, we are exploring the problems, but also the possibilities of all of this and how it's going to affect Caribbean societies. We look forward tonight, though, 
to learning more about the perspectives of media professionals on these developments. And it is with this final word that I give way back to um, Dr. Hunt, who will introduce our next speaker. So thank you and welcome to the University of the West Indies Cape Hill campus. Thank you, Dr. Innes, for your insightful observations. I'll be brief. I'll simply just invite Mr. Wood to give his remarks on behalf of the nation. Protocols having been suitably established, good evening. I'm pleased to see so many of you here this evening, and I notice our former CEO, Vivian Gittins, in the audience, and long-standing <laughs> advertising manager, Mr. Wilfred Field, in the up crowd. Yes. I'm honored to be here tonight to deliver the opening remarks on behalf of the board, management, and staff of the Nation Publishing Company Limited in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the nation and the 60th anniversary of the University of the West Indies Cape Hill Campus. These two organizations can both boast of changing the lives of many on this island, and it is a privilege that they've been able to come together to mount this series of lectures. I find tonight's topic particularly intriguing because like many of you over 45, and I'm going to show my age now, I grew up in a, in a house where radiofusion reigned supreme. It was the only station we listened to because it was permanently on in our home. We grew up hearing voices like Olga Lotzeel, Alfred Pragnell, Frank Pardo, young Julian Rogers, and others of that stature. And then Julian Rogers came back and transformed VOB, two other staples on the media landscape, VOB and Julian Rogers. Back in those days, Radio Fusion did not have to compete with anything or anyone until CBC came along. Now I'm told there are as many as 16 radio stations in Barbados competing for different audiences, which is testimony to the changing media landscape on the island. Once upon a time, we would have said the future of this media landscape was AI. But in fact, AI is here. Artificial intelligence has arrived, and there was not even a fanfare to announce its presence. It kind of crept up on us because we've been using computers and fancy cell phones for a while, asking all sorts of questions and getting the answers, but not thinking about it as AI. But now, as we are moving to the next level, where people want to use AI to do their work, answer question papers, write dissertations, create graphics, play music, even make your coffee and turn on the lights. We sit up and start to pay a little more attention. At The Nation, we have gone from one printed publication a week, 50 years ago, using typewriters and pasting up copy on a page, to operating with computers, and now a fully online e-paper on our website, and a strong presence on key social media platforms. Over time, we had to embrace the technology to stay current, and not just current, but on the cutting edge in order to stay ahead as one of the leading publishing companies in the region. But however we move forward in the future, we will always be mindful of the principles laid down by our founders, principles of good journalism based on honesty, integrity, and truthfulness. So I'm looking forward to tonight's message as we are poised to enter the next 50 years of the nation's experience, existence rather. Thank you. It now falls to me to introduce tonight's featured speaker, 
and I feel as though I'm going to be echoing some of Mr. Wood's observations. The Caribbean has its stories, its voices, its memorials. And as a regional university with an international reach, we have the responsibility to build on and protect the knowledge and experiences of where we are, where we come from. This is part and parcel of creating legacy. Thankfully, as I have observed earlier this evening, this is not a responsibility we shoulder on our own. As many of our Caribbean scholars have pointed out, our region's cultural legacies and practices tend to the communal, which is why that responsibility is shared with others, especially those devoted to the development of our avenues of expression, recollection, and vision, among whom are those in media. Through media, we create a sense of place, of cultural identity, of visibility, that is always in the process of shaping us and what we value. As Mr. Wood pointed out, for those old enough to remember a pre-internet world, media was in a different way already social, in that it has always done the work of connecting us with the world beyond our homes. But that connection was mostly one way. Online networks changed the nature of that connection to an exchange. And who is to say where artificial intelligence will take that relationship? Thankfully, this evening's speaker is well qualified to answer that question, especially within the context of our region. With over 50 years experience in the media industry across this region, Mr. Julian Rogers has done the serious, valuable work of creating and sharing the stories and images of the Caribbean in his capacity as broadcaster, journalist, producer, publisher, and media manager. Among the many positions he has held in the industry, he has been managing editor for Guardian Media in Trinidad, where he led the transformation of news and current affairs operation into digital channels, Publisher for the Tropical Media Group Limited in Antigua and Barbuda, where he launched the Sunday Scoop, the first Sunday newspaper in the Eastern Caribbean outside of Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago. While the manager of the Antilles Radio Corporation Limited in Montserrat, he was instrumental in reformatting the station towards expressing its Caribbean sensibilities. And, has, and as has been observed earlier, for those of us in Barbados, he may be more familiarly known as the program manager of VOB, Voice of Barbados, and in a real sense, the voice of Barbados, as a radio show host and anchor. Mr. Rogers is proudly linked to the university, first as a graduate, then as an advisor in the university's communications programs, and currently, in his role as Managing Director of Media Rogers Group, a contributor to media development with UETV and the Media Institute of the Caribbean. Essentially, accolade and accomplishment can done. But I must, so that you can hear from the man of the evening. Unmistakably, a regional citizen, a pillar of Caribbean media, excuse me, please join me in welcoming to the podium Mr. Julian Rogers. Towards the end, when I read your CV, I was, it, it was just impressive. <laughs> it's just phenomenal to see the amount of work you've done. And so, as like I said, invite him to the podium, but I really meant invite him to the stage because it's from here you'll be giving your presentation. So once again, please welcome Mr. Rogers. Thank you very much. Uh, I look around this room and I see a lot of people 
who've been part of my life for, I don't know, the last 60 years. So I'm very, very pleased that you have found the time to wade through the waters of, uh, of the recent hours to come out. Somebody asked me whether I was going to do a lecture at Cave Hill. And I foolishly said yes. And I said, but Julian Roger, you can't do a lecture, man. You tell stories. So that kind of stopped me in my tracks. And therefore, I'm going to take that person's advice and tell you stories. I also learned from one of my former students that you should not be a slave to your PowerPoint and that you should let it naturally flow and therefore I'm taking that advice. You take advice from younger people, it works. I have to give you the, the story behind this lecture or conversation with you. Chelston Lovell called me, I'm sure it must be nearly a year ago, to ask me if I would join in this effort of delivering a lecture at the university. And I said yes, not thinking what would be required of me. Until a few months ago, he called again and he says, we have a date. Would you be available in November? And I said, yes, I'll be available in November, as long as it is close to my birthday, which is the 11th. So I expect all of you to start singing happy birthday now. <laughs> so we finalized that the lecture will be done on this date. Then he called me back and he says, so what is going to be the title of your lecture? And I said, can I call you back? And I went to my computer, where I live 24 hours a day when I'm not sleeping. And uh, opened up my PowerPoint, which is my first tool anytime I'm working. I'll tell you more about AI afterwards. So I figured out, you know something? Julius Gidden said that Kefil is celebrating 60 years and you've been in the business for 60 years, so you have a parallel story. And that was it. From rediffusion to AI. Something else happened as well. I have been trying my level best to respond to the people who tell me every time I talk about my experiences across the Caribbean and media, they say, Rogers, you should write a book. And including Julius, of course. And my daughter, one of my daughters, Shani, who studied at a very prestigious university in the United Kingdom, Leicester, famous for training a lot of media people. I started writing something. And I showed her. She's my daughter. She loves me very much but she is as unkind <laughs> and as critical as Alison Leacock. <laughs> and I decided after that, I ain't writing no book. <laughs> if that is the cruelty that I must undergo, forget about the book. My biggest problem was finding the right title. What, how, if I could get the title right, I could begin to write. I thought about writing about my many wives and girlfriends. And I was going to portray the many wives and girlfriends as my travels across the Caribbean, working in Montserrat and Antigua and Barbuda and uh, St. Kitts and Anguilla and St. Martin 
and having an impact and interesting in Guyana and St. Lucia and Dominica and so on. Those are my girlfriends. Don't ask me about my many wives. That's my business. So I failed every which way in which to get this book started. But tonight, I'm happy to report the thanks to the university and Chelston and Julius. I now have a title for the book. One, two, I've written 31 chapters. And the first draft of it I sent to a very famous journalist in Jamaica called Canute James, who having read, called me up and says, have you got a publisher? And I said, no, I mean, I could self-publish, I suppose, or that's what you do these days. He says, no, you have enough here to send this to a publisher. And I said, and, and, and my wife, Alison, said immediately, so you'll get a big deposit on the book. That was our main concern. You're going to get an upfront fee? I don't blame her. So I have to tell you tonight that I've written so much about the book. I have found a tool online, thanks to AI, to assemble and rearrange the chapters, etc. And I've also set myself a timeline, which was something that Canute James said to me. He says, when do you think you'll finish the book? Hear me, by Christmas. <laughs> he says, you're sure? I said, well, you know, yeah, this is, now, this is November. I go to Barbados, I come back. I could spend like three weeks writing and whatever else. I'd have nothing else to do and so on. But I get up very early in the mornings. It is a bad habit from television where in doing morning shows, I'm up at 4 o'clock and I'm on the road by 5 o'clock to get to the station to make sure that my face looks right and that my show rundown is right and my guests are standing by and the production crew have coffee and so on. And it came to me. You have to be crazy to talk about putting together this book by December. But you could do it in time for the 60th anniversary of your entry into media, 1st March 2024. I have a timeline, friends. So you can invite me back for the book. So here we are. I have a title. Wow. One of the problems I'm going to have tonight is that I have to be fully aware that you all would like to go home at a reasonable hour and that I shan't keep you here till midnight. But I could easily keep you here till four day morning talking about the media. Easily. Easily do it. But here goes. This is Rediffusion. And I'll tell you a quick story. Back in 1963, in December of 63, which is similar to the song by the Four Seasons, I went with a group of students to Rediffusion to buy some advertising for a concert that the cooperative high school was having. As luck would have it, when I arrived there, the only person available to do business with us was the sales manager at Rediffusion. His name was John Oxley. God bless his soul. Do you know what happened? We transacted the business. And when it was finished, John Oxley turned to me and he says, young man, are you interested in radio? And I said, yes, sir. But I'd like to go to university first before I even consider anything like that. I didn't tell him that my father wanted to be a doctor and a lawyer and all them kind of things, right? I never said anything to anybody about that encounter. 
the children who went with me, I've been trying to remember who went with me. I remember a few people, but they remember well. Do you know in 1963, in December, my father retired as the old age pensions officer for the parish of St. Michael. My father raised me, my father and I in a house. And the day I realized that my father was not going to work, I had no clue what a pension was. I went looking for work. Where should I go but to Rediffusion, to Mr. John Oxley? And I said, sir, this is the situation. I need to get a job. You know what he said? You hold on a minute. I'm sending you downstairs to the program manager's office, Frank Pardo. His secretary arranged for me to do the audition. I did the audition in January of 1964. I got a call. Could I come and see them? And I went in to meet Mr. Frank Pardo. I went with a tie, which my father had tied at home, but I was unhappy with the way he tied the cigarette knot. So I went back to school to Wilbert Callender, the headmaster, and I said, sir, I have an interview at Rediffusion. Can you fix my tie? He tied the tie. I went across the river road. You know where Cooperative High School was? Corner of Mountain Dales and Halls Road, right in a shop, what used to be a shop actually. And it was a shop across the road. I went there, Frank Pardo said to me, young man, you did a great, I'm paraphrasing now, you did a great audition. We'd like to hire you. Only one problem, you are so young. I was 16 years, so November, December, January, February. You understand where I'm coming from? in 1964. He said, you are so young. And I said, sir, I need two things. One, I need this job because my father is not working. Secondly, I'm the head boy at school and everybody else is older than me. He says, there are people working here who are old enough to be your father. I said, sir, no problem. I can handle that. So I started on the 1st of March, 1964, at Rediffusion. And this is the, this is the, this is what, this is the era when Rediffusion came into force. The first subscriber hooked up, right? The, the first telephone conversation New York to San Francisco to Indonesia to Holland to England and back to New York. Can you believe that? If they, if they could see what we do right now with the phone, they'd freak out, right? And uh, November 15, 1935, the Nazis revoked German citizenship for the Jews. All oh, this history keep repeating itself, right? Right before our very eyes. Whoa. So what did Rediffusion provide? Rediffusion was a companion. You heard reference it to, to, to it earlier. It was the only radio station they had available in that format. If you had a shortwave radio, yes, you could listen to the BBC and other international stations. But Rediffusion, which was relaying news, entertainment, and whatever else from around the world in that whole period, 1930s, 40s, 50s, coming up to the 60s, when they started incorporating a lot more of their original content. And I could spend the whole night talking about all the personalities that went through Rediffusion, etc. When I joined in 1964, there was a big ruckus in the company because they said they hire a little black boy because the people who are on the air, let me go through that very quickly for you. The man who walked me down the corridor for the very first time in Rediffusion and turned to me and says, can you type? And I said, yes, my father bought me a typewriter last year. 
in summer and he told me I need to learn to type. A little Olivetti typewriter and he brought the Pittman's exam typing book as well. So I had no choice. Nick Stanford is going down the corridor and that corridor represented a place of work for George Mossbaugh, eventually Ogilope Seal, um, Arnold Rampersad, Yusuf Ali, Leslie Sion, a ton load of very special journalists, Joe Broome, who you feared the hell, who strode down the corridors, and if you did anything wrong on the air, he would let you know that you should go back to your grandmother's house and stay there and never come out again. <laughs> These were giants. And this little fella arrives 16 years old, not even 17, expecting to be a radio announcer. And what happened? He took me straight to the program department. I walked in, and all these people were there preparing programs, typing away, etc. good looking Marquita McKenzie, <laughs> and so on, right? I, all that, I'm saving for the book. You all can get all of them stories, okay? But what I learned was that rediffusion was the source of everything that Barbadians believed in, in the news, first of all, all right? There was a standard at Rediffusion that was controlled not just by Frank Pardo and Alfred Pragnell, but by Papi Lovell, the security guard who went to Cuba and cut cane and whatever else and came back to Barbados. And if you made a mistake on the air, God help you when you were coming back to try and leave the building, Papi Lovell will just quietly say, boss, it wasn't too good today, you know. That's a standard, okay? That was Rediffusion. Death announcements. Till today, Rediffusion's still making plenty of money, right? From death announcements. Not only Rediffusion, every radio station and TV station across this Caribbean and the newspapers as well. So you need to understand what force Rediffusion was at that time. It was cable radio, guys. For you who are too young and quiet, let me, let me explain to you how the thing worked. At the headquarters of Rediffusion, which is now on River Road, but it wasn't always there, it was on Trafalgar Street. You had a setup that fed that signal across Barbados via the telephone poles or the electric poles, etc. Just wires, huh? Wires going from place to place. Eventually, well, they had uh, what they call booster, booster stations along the way. But wires going eventually from house to house, huh? So it wasn't just a direct line from the pole to your house anymore. There was, in some, in some areas, they could literally move it and hook up Paulette House with, with Carol House because they were living next door to each other. That's rediffusion. Okay? I don't want to talk about Joe Chuda and Ogilop Seal and all these people. I mean, we can spend the whole night talking about the value of rediffusion. Calling program, Frank Pardo did a calling program once a night, once a week, sorry, on a Thursday night. Leslie Sion, brilliant, not just in putting the news together, but presenting it. What an outstanding voice and a guide and a mentor for me. 1966, I am doing my first real serious outside broadcast and I'm there busy looking over the notes in the newsroom and whatever else, and Leslie Sion hovers over me very quietly and says, young man, tomorrow, when you're on that broadcast, I want you to just talk about what you see. All them notes and things that Alfred Pragnell prepared and so on, the history of this and the ding, the ding, 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 ding. And I followed it to the letter, so much so that when I returned to Rediffusion, Leslie Sion said, good, good job, good job. Okay, you know, he did a... You do a little bow, right? Good show, good show. One of the best compliments I've ever received in my life, okay? Okay, let me, let me move on, because we're gonna be here a whole time. This here is a Grundig radio. It has a turntable in it. It can tune in to 
the AM stations, they have FM in them days, forget about that, right? Short wave and medium wave. The short wave can go all around the world, all around the world. The medium wave could go a great distance too. Let me explain something. If you transmit it from Barbados on AM, that signal literally skipped across the water and went all the way to Guyana. That is why when I was, when I, later years I went to, to Guyana to do a training program with the, the broadcasting company there. And the people say, but we listen to Voice of Barbados every day. And we want to be, we want to be like you all, right? So that was AM. All right, this shortwave story, I have a great story coming up in my book. <laughs> this, this is, where Toyka is, right? This is how many people across this Caribbean saw video news. The Government Information Service had these mobile units and they went to playing fields. They go to Belfield and they go to Bayland and down out in back of St. Lucie and so on and put up a screen and that speaker on top there belching out the sound and people standing you know, around with a drive-in cinema, isn't it? All right. I want, to, I, want to, I want to say something specifically about the newspaper sector because we've had newspapers in the Caribbean going back to the 1800s. A lot of papers got started in, in the region by one person, for instance, who felt that, one, they needed to make a statement and raise the public attention to particular things that were wrong in the relationship between the islands and the colonizer, whether it was the British or the Dutch or the Spanish, etc., across this region. So they were the single man operations, etc. This was what they call media for the public good. These people weren't interested, weren't, and this was not a business, Paulette. They weren't trying to make any money. <laughs> right, Wilfred? This is not about selling advertising. Right? You never sell any advertising in your life, right? Okay? So, you have to understand the environment in which these people operated. Single man, single men, men. Not, not, I can't, I, I didn't find any women yet. But anyhow, we'll, my research will, will win. So, but eventually, let's, let's come to a period here in the 1800s, again in the 1900s, the Glena. The Glena is still alive today, guys. The Gleaner used to put out so many pages, we were embarrassed, right, Wilfred? It was such a thick paper, a broadsheet. We said, what? But I mean, they had three million people, so we had many newspapers. Can you imagine we had a paper called The Barbadian, Wilfred? We even had one called Penny Paper. You know how, you know how much I would cost, right, Paulette? Right? Look at that. Right? This is, an, this is an Antiguan paper. You all think Antigua easy, right? Um, sorry, camera guys. Um, Bahamas had the Argus, among many papers. Um, Dominica still had a chronicle until recently, actually. Chronicle is also a famous name for one of the papers in Guyana. Um, yeah, this is the pen and paper. This is Barbada Sea. We got St. Lucia Gazette. There's another Gazette. St. Christopher, where is St. Christopher? You know where that is? St. Kitts, right? St. Kitts. And the West Indian. The West Indian is, a, is an interesting story. You students at, at BCC should look at the history of the West Indian because it is, it is both Grenada and Barbados, okay? It tells you a lot about the linkages at the time between these territories. Aha! My father sent me to the Barbados Advocate, number 34 Broad Street, which is now the mall, to see a friend over there and to drop off some stuff. And I was, the, 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 the press operation is on the ground floor and it was the hottest place. I, say, I swear blind that was where hell was, right? But that was the hot type area. There were the men putting, the, putting, these, putting these letters together to be able to print the paper. It was hot type. Okay? That's a, that's, a, that's a great story to check out on. This now, you move from there to this. When I went to 
to work with the, with the, um, with the observer, and many of you in, in the printing business here would understand, that the, the whole effort was to get to computerization of as many functions as possible. Um, it meant less people, but there was greater efficiency, uh, greater speed, if you needed to change stuff, et cetera, in terms of the, the plates and whatever. And, 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 and printing is a, is, a, is a highly conceptive business. It uses up a lot of material. So you need to really keep tabs on the cost of operation. Um, so there you are. So we move from small monkey presses, etc. Some people use a, a stenograph, a photocopier, all kinds of things to print paper across this Caribbean. When I went to Antigua to the Observer in 2000, 2001, right? They had a very small press. And to, I mean, really, really until today, today, they're printing a paper, not printing anymore because everything has gone online, but it was letter size. They're accustomed to it and that was it. They had a tabloid for some time with the outlet uh, and so on. They had the, the Antigua Sun, which uh, Alan Stanford, you know, put up his big press and so on and, 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 and produce a paper. But I'll tell you something here, which I want all of you to be aware of, of how expensive it is to print a newspaper. And I'm making an appeal to you today because I know what it is that everybody, every family in Barbados should make a commitment to buy a newspaper every day. That's the first thing. I know that I'll, I, no, I'm serious. I, I'll tell you why. Some papers are online. If the paper is online and you can subscribe to the paper online, if it, even if it is free, let me explain what, what, what I'm driving at here. The, the, the paper, the cost, of, the cost of doing, sorry, the cost of producing the paper is highly expensive. It is nowhere near what it used to be many moons ago. I'll tell you why. They have to buy newsprint. And every year that newsprint cost is going up. Newsprint is, is trees being cut down in Russian forest and wherever else in Canadian. Canadian mills and whatever. And the guys have, the people who are producing the paper for us to use to print the newspaper have formed a cartel very much like how the oil cartel people have done. And they decide the price. So my last check with my former financial controller is, she said to me, Mr. Rogers, that price that we budgeted for in 2021 is now heading somewhere close to 1,200 US dollars a ton for the paper. Let me give you one, one other element in this, in this matter, is that the formula is that you must have the cost of production of the paper represented by the street sales. So what's the circulation manager, my good friend? What's his name? Edmund Holder. So Edmund Holder is expected to have his band of people go and sell enough papers to cover the print costs. What are the print costs? The paper, the staffing, the machinery, the servicing, spare parts. You go through the whole works. It don't happen like that anymore. So that is why they hung Paulette and tell her, if you don't sell enough advertising to pay for the cost of the printing of the paper and all the other costs that we have in this company, dog eat your supper. Am I correct? Absolutely. OK, good. I'm not telling tales out of school. I am fresh from managing a newspaper company, so I know I'm, you know, last December I was the managing director of the Jamaica Observers. I can tell you, I'm not telling any Thing, so I know exactly what's happening. So Vivian will be hounding, right, at the top of the chart, 
and saying, but I have to go to the board and tell them something. <laughs> okay? All right. So I, I'm giving you that sneak, huh? You're reinforcing my message. I have to reinforce that message, Noel. After all, we're in the business together. Okay? All right. So that's, that's one of the things you need to know. I'll give you a window. So I'm, I'm see, seriously, if, if, if there's a headline tomorrow, it should read, Julian Rodgers said everybody should, should have a, a newspaper in their family every day. Okay? It makes a lot of sense. And I'll tell you further, if you invest in the, if you invest in the media, and this is not just now the newspaper, if you invest in the media, Gabby will not be able to write a new song called Riots in the Land. Because if the populace of Barbados or Trinidad or Jamaica or Grenada or whatever the case may be don't have an outlet for their frustrations and concerns and issues and whatever else, there will be riots in the streets. Trust me. You have to look at the media as a key player in the development of these countries. And if there's no platform for people to talk, to share, for the media to act as an educator and entertainer and whatever else, we're going to have problems. And the only way the media can do that, because some people feel, don't realize the media is a business. Just like Pine Hill Dairy. Only difference is the people down in Fontabelle, I did the advocate, or um, uh, uh, the nation don't get land at $100. <laughs> Need I say anything more? This, my, this, I put this up so that, again, my students would understand where we're coming from. This is a newsroom. Okay? You see a typewriter there? All right, that's not electric typewriter. You had to take your hand on. <laughs> and bring back the carriage, okay? All right. Next to that is a, is a teletype. Oh, Lord, you need to go and check up on that. I'm not telling you what that is. That's your, that's your homework to do. When I went to Rediffusion, by the way, in 64? Uh, yeah, as recent as, as, recent as, um, as 1982. Yes, as recent as 1982. They didn't, have a, they didn't have electric typewriters. Wilfred? The secretaries had a typewriter that came in a desk from England. And it had what I call bowels in that you, you press a lever and the typewriter disappeared into the bowels of the desk. And the first day that computers were introduced at River Road in the sales department by the, 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 the dear beloved secretary, she resigned immediately. She said, I put in 30 years, I am dealing with them computers at all. Which is about the fear, right? Fear of technology. All right. This is a modern newsroom. This is the Guardian in Trinidad, where I spent the whole of 19, sorry, 19, 20, 2018 into 2019, merging the newsrooms of CNC, television, CNC 3 television and the Guardian newspaper. They were in separate, the, 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 the print people were down in, in central Trinidad, in Chaguanas, and the TV people were in Port of Spain. And my job was to bring them all together and create one newsroom. And boy, I fight up the union, I fight with everybody, but I was happy to go back. And everybody said, but you know something, the thing working. The print people who didn't have a clue about, about television are now, and they, they form teams which is what I was saying to them and to the union, if you do not end up being more valuable as a result of this exercise, then I need to go and sell mangoes on the street. If you guys are so good at being a journalist in print, you're good in television, you are, you are, you, you are really communicators, so there's no reason why you can't learn to use the tools and be excellent at it. Yes, some of you can be brilliant and never ever cross over. But the result is that you will end up being so very useful to yourself, one, for the present enterprise you're working with, and you're very attractive to be poached by another media house and get more money and all them kind of things. Yeah? Okay. 
So there you go. All right. So that's, my, that's one newsroom. I'm very proud of that uh, particular thing. You know this guy? We don't know this guy. This chap, his name is Trevor McDonald. He's a Trinidadian. He started working his, his career at Radio Trinidad, one of their most outstanding broadcasters. He eventually went to England, and he ended up as the number one anchor in British television, Trevor McDonald. I want you to... I want you to listen to something that he says. And that's, and that's the, way the way it looks tonight. tonight. And, and that, that brings, brings to an end my association with the news at 10.30. Thank, thank you for watching, and thank, thank you for all your generous messages. messages. Good night, and, and goodbye. goodbye. So, let me explain something to you. Trevor MacDonald was so good that a British Prime Minister hired him to teach people in England how to speak English. So help me God. In, in national responsibility to teach English people how to speak English. You heard him just now? Excellent diction. If you hear him in an outside broadcast, if you hear him in an interview, he's the guy who has interviewed Mandela, and he's been to war zones, all kinds of things, etc. That's a guy that you need to, to research, right? Right, okay, so we got that in your heads. CBC, 1963, Radio Barbados, down at the Lazaretta. Remember, we only had rediffusion up to that point, huh? But Errol Barrow decided it was time that Barbados had a radio station. And not just for Barbados. This is one of the things I want you guys to remember. Not just for Barbados. It was called Radio Barbados. But he intended it for the entire Caribbean. Hence the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation. We got black and white TV one year later. You see 63? When I went to Rediffusion, right? Okay, I want to be in radio? Good. 64, black and white TV came. And then later on, of course, color. But I have to tell you that television also came to other Caribbean territories. JBC at the top, you see the guy with the big afro? You recognize Hugh Crosskill? Right? Bahamas, television. This is ZIZ in the, in, the, in, in the corner. And I'll tell you a quick one on the ZIZ story. That was the time when St. Kitts, Nevis, and Angola were all together as one state. And um, Mr. Bradshaw was the premier at the time. And he's giving the British some trouble. So they call him up one day and says, boss, I mean, uh, I mean what is it one, man? And he said, he said to them, would you give us a television station? He said, all right, good. So they sent the engineers down to St. Kitts. And the engineers spent a whole day driving around looking for sites to set up this radio and television operation. <clears throat> and they came back to his office. And he says, well, tell me. And they said, well, we, you know, we saw some places. Blah, 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 blah. And he says, hold on a minute. Let me show you exactly. And he got them into his Land Rover Jeep and drove them out to his house. And he says, I live here. He says, over here is the army compound. That's where I want my radio and TV operation. Secure. To this day, you don't go to ZIZ unless you drive through the army compound. Protected, okay? I'll more, tell you more about that in the book. <laughs> this is Leslie Sion that I referred to earlier. And that WIBS is the Windward Islands Broadcasting Service. It was shortwave radio, and it was designed to connect the banana-producing territories of 
the Caribbean, namely, not Caribbean, but the Eastern Caribbean. So that was St. Lucia, Grenada, Dominica, and St. Vincent. There were heavy banana producing countries and they needed to, to, to connect. So there'd be, there'd be news on there about the banana. Um, most importantly, when the goose, not the goose, the geese, the geese boat is coming in to pick up the bananas, to take them to England, etc., so that the farmers will know when to cut and have the, the bananas ready for Deo, Deo, Deo I come and I want to go home. Right, okay. So much for my singing career, so stick to the book. This is Radio Antilles. Radio Antilles was set up in Montserrat by happenstance, I have to tell you. Um, the original station was in Europe. Sorry. The original station was in Morocco, sorry, owned by uh, some French people. And the Moroccan government started looking at this huge, powerful transmitter and decided that they wanted to take it over. And in the dead of night, the owners spirited that transmitter out of Morocco and left in place a small, smaller, much smaller transmitter uh, for the government to take over. And that transmitter was floating on the water for some time, trying to find out exactly where it should be set up. And they approached the British government, they looked at Barbados, and Barbados said, no, we don't want it, and so on and so on and so on. Anyhow, the British said, why don't you go to Montserrat? And that's where Radio Antilles ended up. Huge AM transmitters, huge shortwave transmitters, and they broadcast in English, French, Spanish, and eventually when Deutsche Welle, the Germans took it over, they, um, they started to broadcast in German, not for us in the Caribbean, but for Central and, and South America, where Germans are. So Radio Antilles, I went there in 1970, when David Rudder told me one, you had to with David Rudder, Michael Rudder. Michael Rudder told me that they needed a radio announcer at Radio Antilles. And that was the first time I'd left Barbados outside of going to Trinidad once with, as a manager of the Fantastics Band. I didn't know, I knew about Radio Antilles, I listened to the station a lot, and I knew it was an old, you know, really um, run, sorry, featured a lot of pirate DJs, former pirate DJs from England. Um, and so I went there in 1970. And I was off and on. Eventually, I became head of the English service. Uh, two years later, I returned there. Uh, that was the start of, of, of a number of things. Antilles had a couple of correspondents in uh, some of the territories in the English-speaking Caribbean, but I decided, you know, two things needed to happen. Radio Antilles never played any Caribbean music except the Merryman and Sparrow. So that was the first thing I needed to change. The second was to expand the Caribbean, the, 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 the correspondent network, to every territory where Radio Antilles was heard. So I looked out and found Guyanese, St. Kitts, Grenada. Well, we, ha we had Grenada, but I got Grenada in. Um, St. Vincent, Trinidad. That's when I went to, to, um, to Trinidad and over a dinner, dinner of, of snack chicken, I, I remember I hired Dick Henderson to head up the newsroom, um, and so on. But that, I, that's a whole other big chapter in the book. I want to raise this matter of the BBC Caribbean service because I think it is part of our media landscape. Here was a situation where we had Caribbean journalists based in London, beating the tail off of us back in the Caribbean by making good, solid connections. They, I mean, they had, they had for our difference anyhow. But the, 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 the stamp of the BBC, one, allow them to have access to people, particularly the leaders, when we in the Caribbean didn't have access to. In other words, we're calling from the BBC Caribbean service. Can we speak to Prime Minister, please? And you get put onto the Prime Minister. But if I pick up the phone and call Prime Minister, I ain't getting through. You understand? That was the way it was. But they provided a vital service for us. 
And of course, it goes back way back when a lot of the outstanding authors, writers, etc., were broadcasters and, and contributing to the content of the BBC Caribbean service. So you'll see going back to 1943, um, the services closed at one point, then reopened again, and then shut down in 2011. And a long list of, of famous people were there. All right. I have to go to the controls. Because some of you are familiar with this song. Oops, sorry. Julius, I'm not doing something right here. What is it? Anyhow, let me tell you what that is. What the, the zeros and the ones, really, the sound that was supposed to come out there was when you had to dial up for internet. You remember the, you remember the song? <laughs> right? Okay. And sometimes it, it connected and sometimes it didn't. Oh, man. Look at, look at us there. 100 meg at home. No problems whatsoever, okay? Come a long way. Talk about coming from a long way. Look at that. The evolution. Who in here had a Nokia phone? Everybody? Everybody had a Nokia, right? And look how they lost their way now. Anyhow. Every, how many people had a brick? What I call a brick, next to the red phone? Huh? Yeah, next to the Nokia was the brick, okay? Uh, that's a Motorola Fold, which is now topped off by Samsung's Fold and Flip, etc. Okay, so much for that. How many people had a college encyclopedia in the house? Put your hand up, hi. All right, every, ho every Beijing house had to have one of them. There were two things that used to happen on the weekend, Allison. The man that's picking up, the Indian man picking up the money for the clothes. <laughs> and the other fellow picking up the money for the encyclopedia, <laughs> right? No matter how desperate your family was, your parents can make sure you get an encyclopedia in the house. It wasn't a status symbol, it was an education. They, they, they worked out, hey, I didn't have the opportunity you had, so I'd given it to you, and one of the things is the encyclopedia. And my father had a vast, expensive, extensive library in the house. I had gold leaf versions of of, of, of Shakespeare and all them kind of things and so on in the house. But it was the colors encyclopedia that really was my resource. So when my headmaster, Wilbur Callender, started to talk about various things and so on, I go home quick, pull out P to Q, <laughs> and checking out colors. So when he come tomorrow morning, I'm ready. West Indies cricket, playing in Australia, or England, wherever the case may be. The man going down the road with the transistor radio glued to his ears. Right? Glued to his ears. And of course, you could get, you know, famous names. Sony was around all back then. Hmm. So here we are now. I put this up, and, and I'm sorry, this is, this is Lara making big scores, right? But I put that up because I want to tell you a, a, another story here. For a long time, the only way for us to find out how the West Indies were playing was to listen to the radio, okay? That was made possible by cable and wireless providing what was known then as a circuit a line between Australia and Barbados and then distributed to the rest of the Caribbean radio stations. Cost a lot of money in those days, as you would expect, right? From cable and wireless at the time, providing they didn't have any competition, right? Um, I put up Caribbean Broadcasting Union because the the leaders of, of media at that time decided, oh boy, this thing is so expensive, we really need to get together, make one approach to cable and wireless, we share the costs. And so Barbados, Jamaica, Trinidad, and Guyana paid a, more, a major portion of those fees for those circuits, right? And the other territories 
were, you know, were paid, paid on their share. That was one of the ethos of, of, of CBU, Caribbean Broadcasting Union. You'll hear me talk about people like Hugh Chumley and so on. Um, and the other was to bring together producers and writers and, and journalists in what they call Project One. Um, so that you had somebody from Jamaica, somebody from Antigua, somebody from Trinidad, and somebody from Guyana, and they went to one territory to do a particular story. And they did that package and then they sent it back. And one of the things I remember was I was at university in 74, 75, and the first ever Commonwealth Prime Minister's meeting was held in Jamaica. And the CBU gathered a set of us together. Think about that. Ron Sanders, Jones P. Madeira, Julian Rogers, a little fella, right? And a Jamaican core of people. And every day, our job was to track down the leaders of the Commonwealth Prime Ministers and tell the stories to the rest of the Caribbean every day. So that is part of that history. Of course, the CBO has gone on to doing much more than that in subsequent years. Then Kana, which is really um, the, the successor to what was Reuters Caribbean, uh, it, 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 it's like we gained our independence then, and we started now with our own staff and driving the news production process with our own networks of correspondence. The CMC was really a commercial side to this entire business. Um, the, the CBU and the CBBA, was it? Anyhow, the, the two groupings, both making an approach to the European Union to set up a set of, of satellite, um, 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 what do you call that? The dishes, big dishes, these transmitters. Are, anyhow, and they, they said, but why don't, you, why don't you guys join forces and create one entity and make one approach? So that's where CMC was born. Um, quick one on training, which I think is very, very much at the heart of where we go in the future. You have the Barbados Community College, you have Caramat, and by extension, wherever the university is, there's some training component there. King Gordon School in Trinidad, and the Media Institute of the Caribbean, which is in recent times, uh, concentrating particularly on investigative journalism and really, really doing an outstanding job, uh, Kiran Maraj and, and, and Wesley Gibbons, etc. Do you see me? Anybody see me? I had an afro. What's wrong with you? <laughs> All right? Um, yeah. Louis Lee Singh at the end from Trinidad. Um, the chap at the back, I can't remember his name, but he was at the government, the Jamaica Information Service. Uh, Salisha Ali in the wheelchair um, from Trinidad and Tobago. She'd lost her legs in a train accident many moons before, the, many moons, of, but outstanding broadcaster. Rose Villot behind her. Um, Alma Mokien, who was at, uh, at um, University Radio. And she was, she was a, a mature lady who decided that, hey, I, they, they have, have a training program at university, I'm going to be there. Um, up above her is uh, Keynes from St. Kitts. Behind him is a chap whose name I'm trying to remember from Guyana. That's uh, Michael Maycock there with an afro next to him. Down in front here, this little lady is Flo O'Connor from Jamaica. Oh boy, fantastic lady. Uh, Michelin from, uh, from St. Lucia next to her. Errol Hossein, Trinidadian, doctor in communications, etc. Uh, Patel next to him is from Jamaica Broadcasting. Errol Rollins, who was the deputy principal at the time. Yusis Asha on the end here from Belize. Um, Cheryl O'Neill from Trinidad and Tobago, who decided that, hey, we have econ on the, on, 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 on the program. Many of you haven't done econ. I'm going home for my books in Trinidad and come back and teach you all behind the chapel. Uh, behind her, uh, Granville Neal from Jamaica. Um, oh gosh, Trinidadian guy is next to her. Gail Matterin. You all know Gail Matterin? Some of you know her. She was, she was at the Office of Negotiating Machinery here in Barbados. The brightest person in the whole class was that guy at the back, Frank Campbell from Guyana. Frank Campbell from Guyana. Among our lecturers was Rex. Professor Rex Nettleford and Roy Auger. 
and we used to scramble into uh, Rex Netterford's office at the Trade Union Center. It was big enough, you could only turn around in it, right? And 30 of us going there. Some of us on the ground, what of us standing up, what of us giving? Because you don't want to miss a Rex Netherford class, no matter what. Yeah? There's a man talking, teaching you about history, government, and politics of the Caribbean. You don't get sick. You don't miss that class. You don't miss Roy Auger, et cetera, all right? You miss Compador, right? Quick one. Professor Compo taught economics. When he came to the class, he was the first class every day, daylight saving time. So you understand Jamaica dark at that hour. And we saying that, why, why does we have to be here? I mean, this place dark, right? Anyhow, Compo would come into the class and he have a little speaker system and he come and he set it up. He have a very, very small voice. So you have to amplify that voice. The most boring class anybody. <laughs> Boring, boring class. Kumper, Professor Kumper. But all of us, this girl, Cheryl and he determined that we would pass. Econ. She go home in the break, she bring back her books. And guess what? She said half of you will sacrifice to go to Kumper class in the morning. And the other half will go with me behind the university chapel and I will teach you all econ. You know, all of us pass econ. <laughs> right? Kumpa put down a book in the thing. You see this here? This is a telephone directory, which is a waste of time in, anyhow these days. He brought the economic report for Jamaica, which was Boxer Big so, and put it down on all the desks in the exam room and tell us, please, find the stories. This is the first time we ever see that publication in the first place. But that was it. But we pass. Anyhow, that's Kampa. OK, let me move on. How am I doing with time? I suppose I, it's 11 o'clock, right? OK, I'm going to go to a couple of things. One is the reality of social media. This is where Facebook is. I showed this earlier to somebody during the rehearsal, and they said, but I can't believe that Facebook is still on top. It is. I know many of you on the Instagram, etc., but it didn't reach nowhere near Facebook, right? Check your facts. This is October reading for social media. And I can go through Facebook, um, uh, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, YouTube, the whole works. One of the things I need to draw your attention to is the mergers of media companies in the Caribbean. And the two prominent ones are in Barbados, Trinidad, and Jamaica. So RJR, Rediffusion Jamaica, right? OK. And the Gleaner merged. So that's one. And then, of course, you had the merger of the Nation and um, uh, Caribbean Communication Network, right? And when I say merger, maybe that's not the right word to use, Noel, right? They, there's a business. Let's come back to the business of this. And as a matter of scale, if, you are, if your market is too small, what do you do? You look to export, ain't it? So the nation got exported. That, I mean, that, that, that's, that, I'm, I'm trying to make it as, as simple as, as possible for you to understand. But importantly, you understand the, the, the kind of visionary people involved in this Caribbean in terms of the media. So somebody like Ken Gordon, who worked tirelessly to bring the Caribbean media together, provide support for the Starbuck News when President Burnham was starving them of newsprint and so on. All right? Um, but the, 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 the minds that put these, these mergers together are really the heart of ensuring the survival and the ability to thrive of media enterprises in the region. Their dream is that we would have a nation newspaper going across the entire Caribbean and a gleaner going across the entire Caribbean, etc. I have to tell you, the internet has made all of that possible now. So let's talk about media viability, because I think this is one of the things that is critical for everybody to understand, because you all have a stake in it, OK? So we have to chase the money tree. Where 
is the revenue going to come from to sustain the media enterprises in the region? I made one suggestion. If every household bought a newspaper, if every household had cable TV, if every household is subscribing online to the media that is available in their territory, the point I want to make is this. It is possible for those who are doing online media to know exactly when and who is reading, absorbing their media. Those numbers are important. It's important for them to take that to the advertising community and say to them, I have 100,000 eyeballs. So if there are 90,000 households in Barbados, and everybody, every household bought a, news, a newspaper tomorrow, the nation would have to ask the advocate to help them print, right? Or vice versa. You can print 90,000? We come to that. We'll talk about that, right? But I, I'm just giving you the economics of this. You have to understand what's happening here, all right? So on, on, and on the online side now, Barbados today, Trinidad Express, Gleena, Bahamas, whatever the case may be, everybody who is online with an e-paper need those numbers. So when they ask you to subscribe, to put in your name and whatever else, et cetera, they need that data. They need verification that. People are watching, reading, listening. You ever try to, 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 to look at something on YouTube? What happens? An ad comes up first, right? That's all part of generating income to support whatever you're watching, whatever the source is. So let's, let's understand that. Chasing the money is important for sustaining media enterprises wherever they are. There's no, you know, it, it, there's no pot of gold, as, as I was saying, right? Uh, and the, the dollars are shrinking and I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you, give you another, re, another situation. The business enterprises that could spend millions of dollars before are not doing it. Either they don't have it or they're channeling the money differently. So it's not coming to the media in the way it used to be before. They'd rather put somebody to do sampling on a location or to get involved in some marketing exercise with products where they're putting in the hands of people. All kinds of different, different permutations. So therefore, I, I was saying to somebody the other day that um, there was a time in Trinidad where my sh sales manager, Sheeta Bolai, could call up TSTT and say to them, look, I want to put Julian Rogers on the air every hour with the news, and it's going to cost you a million dollars. And the person at the other end would say, Pat Christopher would say, yes, yes, go ahead. No contract in passing, no man. The relationship is such they know it's, it's, it's fine, right? Okay, and the money is there. Try that today. You're lucky if you get $10,000, one. Secondly, it's gonna take time for that person to make a decision because they have to go to so, 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 and blah, 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 blah. You understand where I'm coming from? The thing has changed radically. So where people think that the media business making plenty of money, I have news for you all here. It's not so. And it is a business. So the people who come and expect the media to do things for free, I have news for you. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. You do not go to Cave Shepherd and ask them for anything for free. So why you should come to me and ask me to do things for you for free? I'm sorry. It's a, it's a business. Okay, enough on that. The, the tango I'm referring to, the tech tango, obviously, I don't have to spend a lot of time explaining to you. The challenge here is that some people are embracing technology, others are mortally afraid of it, as the case may be. But the reality is it is with us. It's not something coming down the pipe. So all of you who are using, how many people have Samsung phones in this place? Samsung. Who have Apple? Right, okay, boy, all right. So the reality is that all of the tools that you're using right now are a part of this whole media landscape. And the technology that you are using every day from saying to, okay, Google, where is Allison? Okay, but first you'll have to 
to unlock your device. She says first I'll have to unlock my device. Okay, you right? Um, so you're using, you're using the technology already. So all this fear that you are thing is, 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 makes no sense whatsoever. You're calling Siri to do all kinds of things for you, okay? <clears throat> um, and I want you to, to also understand that the technology is employed in so many other aspects of our lives. So therefore, forget about it. And Bill Gates, by the way, said in his newsletter, which I read yesterday, that in another five years, we are going to not use any apps, which is going to be a death knell for everybody doing an app, app right now. Because with this artificial intelligence, the person you interact with is going to be the person who does everything without you having to switch between this and that and whatever else, etc. By the way, how do, how, how do I copyright this now? AI for me is a, is a person. I have christened AI Albert Instinct is mine, don't thief it, right? But I say to Albert, look, I am doing this lecture on the media across the Caribbean, and I put my thoughts in there. And I say, Albert, give me a narrative for this lecture. And he says, well, it looks like you have a very big job there but I think I can help you. Turns out, based on my input, a narrative about this particular lecture. I take that, my friends, and I go to Grammarly. I put into Grammarly, and first thing I do is get rid of all of Bill Gates' American spellings. And then I write. I rewrite, etc., etc., and fashion the thing. And sometimes I send it back to Albert, I say, what do you think about that? I said, that's not, not looking too good. Would you like me to expand on it for you? So I'm telling you, this technology is not just about young people. Everybody of every age, you already have the tools. Please begin to use it. All right. The attention game, I talk a lot about the audience, the importance of, of maintaining an audience. Uh, is very, very hard in this digital environment because where before the media had a captive audience of so many thousands of people or millions of people, as the case may be, that thing get put up. This, 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 this pie get cut up in so many pieces now that if when you say that you are number one in the market and you look at your numbers and say, well, hold on, compared to who? You're not, a, you're not as big as it used to be, right? But you still have to try to earn the revenues, et cetera, to sustain the enterprise. But that's a whole nother game. This is my top 10 huh, in terms of media viability. That's one, two, three. Four, you have regulatory means to go through in a, num in a number of instances, whether it's licenses for radio and television operations, right, which is one of my bugbears. Um, and I will tell you in the book my attempts to give Barbados a second television station and how it failed because after I write the Prime Minister's office and tell him I want a license for TV and radio, and I was there feeling very smart with myself with Jeanette Lane Clark and Linda Warren and this buddy, Nick buddy, I get a letter, one line letter says, Dear Mr. Rogers, the government does not intend to grant any additional licenses at this time. 1986, the night of the election, Errol Barrow, let me give him his proper title, national hero, right excellency, right, had said that night, that he intended to give CBC competition. And everybody called me and said, boy, Rogers, you're a genius, boy. I had given up my job as sales manager at, at, at Voice of Barbados, Rediffusion, to pursue this second television station for, for Barbados. Read more in the book. <laughs> the content cooking show, whipping up a gourmet meal using the only ingredients I have around that you could afford, but to make a meal that is exciting and interesting for people in Cayman or all the way down to Guyana. All right? You're working with what you have. That's a challenge in this industry. And then the talent show. 
So as soon as you get, boy, in Jamaica, oh, Lord, a cruel man. As soon as you get a good star going, the thief offer them more money, this thing, the next thing, etc. Ah, oh, I'm not ashamed to tell you about that one. That, that one cruel. Number seven. Where your audience literacy is concerned, you have a job. Because the things that you're going to produce for them, they must be able to accept and use and employ and whatever else. That's what I call the limbo. Then the press freedom situation. We're lucky, by the way, in our Caribbean, in most cases, in recent times particularly. But we've had instances where Prime Minister cast a fellow here in Barbados, and the next thing he'd jump on a plane of any kind and never come back as a journalist. If you're working in Haiti, you can be sure that you're going to get killed at some point or the other. You want to know who that person is? Read the book. Right? Um, and all of us have been threatened one way or another. You know? Harl Hoy, God bless his soul, fighting hard against the political directorate. Who I don't want to label you as a, as a BLP yard foul or a DLP yard foul. And you can go through the entire Caribbean. Dr. Eric Williams in Trinidad telling people, burn the, paper, burn, burn the Guardian newspaper. Pressure in Jamaica. In Antigua, don't let me start up about that. Right? The government imposed a, a, a bond for newspaper publishers. Well, know that the, the, the publisher ain't got that kind of money to put on a bond and so on, right? And the, and the, and the government-owned television and radio systems under pressure for the people who are not able to exercise their journalistic, whatever the case may be. Okay. And the, 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 this, matter, this matter of press freedom is... We, we almost take it for granted that we're in a particular situation, but we should never be comfortable about where we are. Always be aware that some threat looms. Whether it's advertisers deciding, boy, me and like how you put that in the paper today, you know? I pull in all my advertising. These are real things. You all don't know about them, right? If you're not working in the industry, but that's the reality of what we're dealing with. And then on top of all of this now, we have this privacy maze that we have to go through. The data privacy is upon us in Jamaica. They're rolling it out. And if you're not, if, they, if, if any enterprise, and not media now, it's everybody, everybody involved in this, you have to protect the people's, the people's data. And the big one for the journalists in particular is what I call the, the reality show, this, this balancing act. Because you're trying to be the source of credible information, but then the other people involved in, in sensationalism, they're giving you a bad name. Um, you also have to dance, the tango around the, the fake news and so on. And there are people out there competing with you who are running little radio stations online or running newspapers online or blogging or whatever the case may be. This is such a fragmented environment for people operating in the media these days that if you didn't love this thing, you'd leave and go and sell mangoes on the street somewhere or coconut or, or something because you, re you recognize them. Them fellas don't have as much pressure as you. And if you learn to cut coconut well, you should be all right. But it's like a Wild West. All right. Where will the next Marvel Manning come from? Where will the next outstanding anchors and producers and whatever else across this entire Caribbean come from in an age where you could have somebody reading the news who is not even a human being. That is, a, that is, that is an Indian anchor. She reading the news left, right, and center. And it is also possible in terms of radio. Radio news. I could sit right here and give you a newscast in less than three minutes based on the newspaper that the nation put out today and have it timed, by the way, to happen at 11 minutes after the hour, every hour for the next God knows how long. And I can give you a female voice and a male voice, and I can give you Julian Rogers' voice, even, 
I ran a test the other day, and my greatest fear was that when the AI voice did the news, he didn't get the name of Reggie Dumas in Trinidad right. He called him Dumas. So you can imagine I'm in Barbados, that you, sorry, you can imagine if I clone my voice to read the news, and my clone voice mispronounced Reggie Dumas' name, I can't go back to Port of Spain. Okay. On the newspaper side, I want to, the, 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 next, the next slides are really focused on what would you do with AI? Okay? What time is it, by the way? Four more minutes. Okay, fine. So I will, I will, you, the timing is fine. I will tell you that AI can be used for many things. Circulation forecasting, uh, pricing as well, and subscription, subscriber retention. Um, you got a lot of the, the analytics available to you which, you, which which you would have a lot of work, spend a lot of time dealing with. Um, you can work out and create hybrid models. Um, you can work out exactly across promotion strategies and so on. Um, and in an age of declining readership, you can use AI really to analyze the trends and make adjustments, etc. You, you see the, the advertising people, the marketing people, and the, and the journalist team need to get together in a room and don't come out until you're all on the same page driving in the same direction in terms of responding to exactly what's happening. Um, and you know, you have the demographic shifts that you have to decide now. Look, go get to the, the statistical department and find out exactly how many old people you have between whatever and whatever, because that is your diminishing market. What are you gonna do for the people who are 20 to 35, for instance? You have to be growing an audience for the consumption of the products that you're putting out. Um, a lot of the algorithms that, that are available to you, you, you need to, to really use it very much so independent, the, the, working out what trends are, where they're putting in breaking news, etc. You have an ability to automatic uh, fact checking, which I will warn you by the way, the AI does get some things wrong. That's why we need human beings to double check. Uh, you know, they call up the university. Um, you can use it to gauge public uh, sentiment on any issue that you want to work on and, and, and get the audience to feedback so that you're not, you're not operating in a vacuum and decide, boy, this is what I think we should do for the people. Okay. Anybody was around when this happened in 1966? The first baby? This is the nation. 73, sorry. Um, so you got that cover. And this is what the nation is today. This is what I, I pulled straight off their e-paper this morning. So I want to say at this point, and this is where I'm going to, I, 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 want, to, I want to stand and deliver this because I think, I think it is important. And I will read what I, what I do have here. Today as we celebrate 50 years of nation's existence, alongside Barbados' anniversary of independence. We recognize that the nation has been more than a newspaper. It has guided our nation's story, nurturing our spirit of independence, and I applaud you. I applaud the nation with pride, admiration, and for your indelible contribution to our country's narrative. So let us rise and cheer and look forward with eager hearts to the following chapters yet unwritten. To the nation, you're a beacon of journalistic excellence. To a grateful nation, you are a cherished architect of our history. Now to the University of the West Indies. We celebrate this institution, which is certainly a jewel in the crown of global, global academia, academia. Our expressions of gratitude barely suffice to encapsulate its contributions to our national and regional development. The University of the West Indies is a pillar of higher learning and a cornerstone of our Caribbean civilization. 
Congratulations to the university, particularly the Cave Hill. Your legacy is one of empowerment, enlightenment, and unwavering dedication to the Caribbean community. Thank you for the opportunities you've provided, the doors you've opened, and the honor of being part of your illustrious narrative. As a proud graduate of the University of the West Indies, I thank you. I appreciate so much the historical background that you've given towards media in the Caribbean. Uh, so many things there that I didn't realize had occurred in terms of the age of our newspapers. And I'm really looking forward to some of the observations and comments that we'll have in this se segment of the evening. So what I want to do is open the floor, both here and online, to any comments, observations, or questions that you have for Mr. Rogers based on his presentation. I know for me, I'm drawn to the latter segment of your discussion about the use of AI. And I noticed that you were focused on how AI could be a tool for strategy and management. And I wondered how you balanced that application of AI with its application as a writing tool because you also mentioned how you use it to help craft the narrative you used in today's talk. So I'm curious about your thoughts on that. One of, one of the things I, I think we need to, and I, I'm speaking particularly to the editors of, of media in the region. Um, I know that one of the first reactions was that a journalist would use the AI tools to write a story. And therefore, that is not the way you want them to do a story. I operate on the basis of immediacy. How quickly can you put that story together and get it out to the public? This is not the time where David Ellis in the CBC newsroom is putting six sheets of paper in the typewriter five carbon sheets, write in the first line, dissatisfied, ball it up, throw it in the garbage, start all over again, three, four times until you get the first line right. Those days are gone. So I am saying that the tools are available for you to deliver very quickly to the audience. The audience don't give a sh <laughs> how you put it together as long as they can understand what you put together. So I'll give you a quick example. If I'm working with a television a, a cameraman in the 1970s, 80s, even recently, and I go to a press conference, and I stand beside the cameraman, and I say to him, Alison Leacock just said something. What's the time code on that? In other words, where on that recording is Alison Leacock's comment about the training program of Cassera? Crucera, right? Okay? I don't need to do that anymore. I don't need to ask him that. You know why? Because her comments ingested into AI, I can ask Albert, Albert, give me the quotation that she made on so, so, so. In seconds, it is there. Emmanuel Joseph. Writing in Barbados today, some weeks ago, on the governor of the central bank's report on the first three quarters of 2023. He wrote a great story, but not for mass consumption, which is a problem we have. So I took the governor's, I took Manny's story, I wrote what I thought the story should be. I asked Albert, what do you think? Albert came back to me and said, okay, let me give you a hand at this. 
You know what I did? I turned around and ingested the, the governor's speech. The, the, the file, the, the literal file, put it in. I took the time to put it in. And I said, Albert, here's what I want. I want a story that is of interest to investors to Barbados. I want one for ordinary general public to understand what's happening. I want just quotes. I want also elements that I can use to put on Twitter, whatever the case may be. I ended up with six different versions of the same story and in record time. So don't tell me that, that, that we need to, to pretend that the tool is, oh, it's jumpy. It's not. It's for us to use. It's like, it's like telling me, well, don't use a typewriter then. Don't use a computer. Don't use a pencil. We're going backwards. We're going forward. What we need to appreciate is that the tool is a, it is a tool. The human being creative is still there. The fact checking is critical. Your creativity in writing is still there. So if you write something and you want to compare what you write with the vast knowledge that's available in the, uh, in the, in the resources, the internet is available to you, use it. So in one last part, mm -hmm. the scientists that we all like on television uh, that makes science very funny, what's his name again? Huh? No, not, not just Bill Nye, the more, more recent guy. Anyhow, huh? Neil deGrasse. Mm -hmm. Neil deGrasse has asked, what is your concern about students using AI to write essays and whatever else and so on? You know what he said? He says, let them go ahead. He says, what you do is have an oral exam. Then you know if they know what the hell they're talking about that they wrote about. <laughs> there you go. Yes, thank you. So I wondered if there were any comments or questions from here um, in the audience before I go to the online audience. Yes, I see a hand here. So I saw that you were talking very positively about AI and how it could be a very useful tool. But what are your thoughts on concerns such as over-reliance on technology that the AI could bring, um, the ethical concerns as it relates to journalism, um, job loss concerns, and also plagiarism concerns? Because um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but AI takes previously made content from other people and uses it to generate the content that you asked for. So what are your thoughts on that? All right. So let's deal with the last one first. Okay? This, this jumbi that is, a, the, the, the so-called, why call it a jumbi that people think, right? What, what, what you're really doing is having access to all the world's knowledge. That's simply that. In other words, the, 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 the people took time to ingest all the material that's available to them, and you're drawing on that. Okay? So you're using that resource the same way you would have gone to this college encyclopedia and check and say, all right, I'm, I need to learn so, 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 so. So, so that, is, that is the resource that you have available to you. Okay. Plagiarism. One of the interesting things about the Grammarly, for instance, that, 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 I, that I use is that when I write something, I ask Grammarly to check whether I have written something that I teef from somebody. And it says, Mr. Rogers, we checked everything on the internet and realized, no, nothing that you wrote, everything you wrote is original. If, however, it picks up something, it would say, in paragraph 25, whatever the case may be, you, made, you, you wrote something which is exactly the same words as John Brown wrote in so, 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 so. So then I end up having a resource, I can, I, 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 a citation that I could utilize, as the case may be. I think that you have to look at this thing as a tool, and that the material that is in there and available to you was prepared and produced by human beings. The machine doesn't produce anything, you know. It is gathering, summarizing, giving you different versions of the thing as you think, so that the prompts what you ask the machine to do is really the heart of what you're getting at. 
and therefore you, you, it, 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 is not a, it is not a reliance as you, as you are suggesting, it is an aid to what you are doing. Look, if you have a grammar problem, and many students do have a grammar problem across this entire Caribbean, you write something, all right, put it through Grammarly, perfect tool. It will show you that your subject and predicate ain't right. Fix it, right? Beware of the, of the French spelling, sorry, the, ink, the, the, the American spelling of certain words, right? Summarize with a Z and all them kind of things and so. Those require a human being to know what is right. It's not just AI putting you right. So you are learning consistently over a period of time what is correct grammar and, and the, 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 the super, superfluous words that you use, these extra phrases to, to describe something that's very simple. So remember, it is a tool. Use it well. And don't let, it's not a crutch. It's a, it's a support mechanism for you to work. Did I miss any part of your thing? No, that's good? Okay, fine. I also wanted to know, does your, do your thoughts still hold up when it comes to the generation of graphics and art through AI? Why not? At least, is it, uh, uh, the, 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 again, in the same way it is manipulating words, it is also manipulating any other element that can be transferred. We're going, we're going beyond the uh, zeros and ones now, okay? You're doing music. So, um, if I have to do a jingle tomorrow, I have two choices. I can ask AI to make a jingle, or I can call Nicholas Branker. Right? But Nicholas Branker has already been using AI long time ago with his, with his MIDI machine. Because he, he, wants, he wants to compose something original, he goes in the machine, he finds some chords, Eddie Grant been doing it, for Gabby, check, um, where the tune is again, right? Okay, he's picking up chords, all of that is the technology at work. So you get an example of chords to set up something and you add rhythm to it and you add beat and, the, and he, he, we, Eddie, Eddie got vex, I mean, Eddie got Gabby vex as hell because he didn't, we always in the morning still trying to put this thing together. It is about using the technology to your benefit. That's it. I wanted to switch lanes a little bit while other people are thinking up their questions or observations mm -hmm. to, um, to the comment you made about avoiding fake news. Yes. And I'm curious about the relationship that news, people, individuals who, like you say, will sit in their homes and create broadcasts, the kind of future relationship you see between those people, what we currently have as established media, and looking at information now as entertainment, because that's what sensationalism does. It takes information and turns it into entertainment. It's not about check, fact checking. It's not about you know, the truth. And what's interesting about the implication of fake news is that it does have significant deleterious effects socially. Because if something is reported on falsely, people get emotionally, re respond to it emotionally, they will act on it. So I'm curious about the ways in which you see established media their capability of responding to fake yeah. news. All right, the, the, the current media, current media have, a, have a tremendous problem in that everybody is now a reporter. Everybody is reporting immediately about everything and anything under the sun. So where, for instance, you had gossip, so we used to have a, 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 a thing in the, in the newsroom at CBC years ago where Arnold Dial would start to tell a lie at 11 o'clock in the morning. And by 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the story that he told was so big and different from what he said first, right? So we used to talk about this gossip train going through, going through the building. People get on the phone and call somebody and say, boy, you're here, so, 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 so. That person tells the next person, the next family, the next friend, which gets maybe very narrow, confined, compared to today. Now, 
you post it. You're posting it on Facebook. You're posting it on Instagram. You're posting it on all these things. Now, all of those platforms have hundreds of people yep. all taking that one story that is so wrong and carrying it all around the place. And the poor media people spending the whole day trying to get to the source of this story to be mm -hmm. able to tell you the, the right thing. The damage is already done. Yep. The damage is already done. We had a case just, just recently in the news with, 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 the, with, the, um, with, the, with the attack on the, in the Gaza. The report said that the Israelis had bombed the hospital and killed 400 people and whatever else and children and whatever else. It turned out that the number 400 was wrong. But it set off a chain reaction across the entire world. Because, boy, you can't kill 400 people. You may, we reach the point now where we, we, we're quite comfortable with maybe if we kill 20. That's where we reach. You understand? But not 400. But the damage was already done. And, and it, it, that ripple effect has gone on and on and on and on and on. So the media is facing the problem of being the final arbiter of exactly what is news up against everybody who goes down the road, sees an accident, takes a picture, and distributes it left, right, and center, including the bodies left, right. We can't do that. We can't, put, we can't put dead bodies exposed like that on the cover of the paper or on the TV. We cannot. It's against our rules of operation. So what I want to, I see there's one quest, there, three questions, and there's one from the online community. So what I'd like to do is start here. Hold on, I have the mic. I'm you sorry. Mic? I got the mic. I need okay. to for All right. I, can. I ain't going no there neither. I was asked to stand, so I stood. Mm -hmm. I you ever considered the joys of, of job in radio? Uh, no, no, different guy. <laughs> 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 I got to yeah. keep standing. Yeah. Oh, dear. For, for oh. the TV people. Oh, what a pity. I should have worn my hat, man. Um, yeah, excellent presentation, um, Julian. Thank um, you. Nice walk through history. I wish you'd had the Christmas jingles in there, because I think really Fusion and Christmas jingles came together. Yes. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but you obviously you're familiar with them, but yes. some of the guys in here might have been too young. Yes. Uh, how many shopping days you have left for Christmas right. and stuff. Have you done a Christmas shopping? And I've been begging a gentleman called the late Dennis Johnson to find those things and when you threw the records out and you changed over to the new technology and stuff, all those things apparently got lost. And that's really a pity. But um, yeah, um, yeah, you mentioned quite a bit and you brought back all of those memories and stuff. But the thing about AI, I have to say quickly because I know she's looking at me, she has questions to, you know, AI, I'm thinking, can do deeds and bills too. They can, they can settle arguments and discussions. Mm -hmm. They can do contracts. Yeah. I'm thinking not about using it as a tool. I'm thinking about a complete replacement of swap out and swap in. And I don't know, that kind of, that kind of swap out would be a hard ask for some individuals in Barbados because, you know, <laughs> change is nice, but <laughs> not that kind of a change. AI is certainly a very powerful tool and very threatening to certain types of professions in Barbados. But with regards to your particular profession, I appreciate the fact that you guys are excellent um, interviewers. You make people feel comfortable. You draw the best in people. You put a gloss on the most average person, so by the time you're finished talking and interviewing them, they're very special. You make Larry King and those, and, and yourself, I think you got David Ellison here somewhere. You guys are very good at interviewing. What, I'm not talking about the AI part. What about the part where you're supposed to operate as a fourth estate? Okay. I mean, that used to happen back in the day when they had the old-fashioned politicians, but nowadays you've got these guys who are so highly qualified and highly skilled at using the media. You know, it's very difficult now to demonstrate that these guys could probably go wrong, go off the rails. You'd end up polishing them even more, and they find them using the media now to make themselves look even better, as opposed to the media finding opportunity to demonstrate to the public, well, my job is to, meet, to, to enlighten you, mm -hmm. so by the time you get to the polls, you'll be far more... Yeah. All educated. Right. Does think, that make sense? Yeah. I, I, I'm, I, it, 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 it is an interesting matter that you raise because only this morning, you know, I, Chelson, you owe me because you, you, you have me 
thinking about this situation night and day. I get up in the morning thinking about all the things I'd like to raise. You raised something, and I, I'll, I'll tell you what I, what, I, what I thought of this morning. When I worked at Rediffusion moons ago, there were a couple of things that, that we had to know as, as radio announcers. One, how to react and handle if the queen died. And the other was how to handle the politics of a general election. And what struck me today was that those rules have been completely rewritten. If the queen dies, or had died, um, and any member of the royal family died while we were on the air, we had a guide that said exactly what we had to say, what music to play, when to go to, um, um, uh, what do you call that again? Um, no more wine and walk up music on the radio, etc. cetera. Huh? Morning period, right, mm -hmm. going to the morning period. All right, so that, that's on the royal family side. On the politician side in relation to the elections, the party in power got the majority of the airtime during the election season, which was, you know, from the time the, the, um, the what you call it, was called. Not when the election is called, but the nomination day, between nomination day and election. So the party in power, let's, let's say that, that the broadcast time given to the party in power was one hour. The party in the opposition could only get 15 minutes for the broadcast, etc. So it was a portion. That rule doesn't apply anymore. No political party will go and argue with CBC or VOB for airtime again because they're already broadcasting. They're already online. The political meetings are carried live by them on their platforms, etc. So you're giving them 15 minutes for a party political broadcast, don't make any sense. They have enough money to buy the ads before nomination day. And you know, in, in Antigua the other day, the last election, there was one guy who is so rich that he nearly buy out all the time on the radio station. So his ads weren't 30, minute, 30 seconds long or even a minute long. He, 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 he buy for a whole tune. A whole tune, you know, you know that, that reggae tune about um, there's a place in heaven for you, right? How long is that? That's about six minutes long, isn't it? Right? He paid for that to be his campaign contribution. So the rules have changed there. And I think that what you're, what you're raising there is one of our biggest challenges, which is how does the media fulfill its role um, in, 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 a, in a democracy? That really is at the heart of this discussion. So we're not just there reporting the news relaying the news, but relaying, for instance, the, the, the counterpoint of, 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 of contest between the political interest and the public. So the public needs to be informed best about whether they should vote for one candidate or the other. It's not everybody is a diehard yard foul going be, behind one party or the other and going to every political meeting and whatever else. There are people who are not in the midst of that fray, but see the responsibility that they must vote. And therefore, they need to know exactly what are the, what are the, what are the ingredients of not just the party, but the individual, etc. There's where I think the media comes in. So yes, we give air time to interviewing, you know, opposing candidates in a political constituency. We, we, we do interviews that we put in the paper and so on. There is a role for us. And I think that is, a, that, that, that is something that, that we need to look very carefully at. We have to manage it, obviously, because you know before we get accused of being uh, siding with one side or the other, as the case may be, look, in the Barbados situation, there, there clearly is a role for the media because you have one party holding all the seats. So how does the other side get to be heard and seen in this context? Um, and if you read, read my book next year, you will hear exactly my particular experiences in, in Trinidad and in Antigua 
and in Jamaica and in, and in Barbados, how the, how the politicians move and manipulate and use the media, etc. I mean, you know, I wouldn't tell you I was taken off the air before the 1999 election, but, but yeah, that's in gonna, the book. Yeah. I was going to say that I, I was thinking through your opening comments when you prophesied that we could be here all evening. Yes. Right? <laughs> So in order to address that, what I want to do is have these questions, just <laughs> briefly state your questions and you can briefly give your yeah, responses. I will, I will yes. And then I, I want us to kind of wrap up in the next five minutes. So okay. I saw someone outside the microphone. Yes. Um, I'll try to keep my questions very short. Um, I'm speaking comparatively in this um, first question. We say we want to go green, but mm -hmm. we are still digging for oil. We're saying we want to go paperless. So I want to know how you see the future of newspapers in this paperless society of the so-called future. If, 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 um, yeah. My second question is this. It, I guess it, it's you. You are a Caribbean person. And um, Radio Fusion is one Caribbean, right? That's mm -hmm. what I call it, one Caribbean? Yes. So how do you see us as this CARICOM separate nonsense when we could become one nation and we wouldn't need CARICOM? Okay, let me, let me, let me, let me make it very quick. <laughs> uh, one, to answer your last question, um, I think the answer lies in, in, in partnerships. Um, between, uh, uh, sorry, um, among, the, among the media entities um, and not just mergers and acquisitions as the case may be. Um, for instance, if something is happening in Jamaica of interest to the rest of the Caribbean, the nation wants to, to put that together. Um, in the old days, they would send Al Jilks up to, to wherever the big story was, etc. They can't afford to do that anymore, but they need a story. So therefore, they need a partnership with another media house in Jamaica or Grenada, as the case may be, to get the story. Your first question really raises something that I am um, very fearful of saying, but I will say it nonetheless. Because where I presented the, the, the crisis, really, of the newspaper industry as regard the cost of operation, the challenge here is that if tomorrow a newspaper that publishes daily decides that it's going online only, it can't do that between today and tomorrow. I'll tell you why. If you're earning a billion dollars um, a year from, from advertising, traditional advertising as the case may be, for a print publication, you're not going to get that kind of money from the online uh, edition. So we're between a rock and a hard place in terms of that conversion. It will, you know, we've been saying that the newspaper is going to die and the radio station going to die and whatever else for many decades now. So it really is a matter of how we manage what our future moves will be. And I think AI gives us an opportunity to move progressively to that. Because what I envisage is this. We, we need to concentrate on our core business, which is we need to put journalists in the field and create more content that is appealing to various sectors of our audience and all the other services that we, re that we have now, that we have peopled, I'm sorry, we either outsource it, whether it's to AI resources or to other companies that do these specialized services, as the case may be. And we, we concentrate on the business of journalism. That, I think, is in our future, an immediate future, actually. Um, good evening. Good evening. I apologize for being late, but I had to be here to see an icon. I just touched down in the country, actually. But my question is basic, but not so basic. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if you touched on it, but it has to do with the English language. Can you bring the microphone up? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. My question has to do with the English language, the use of the English language. Mm -hmm. And it may seem basic, but it's not very basic. Too often, and I said, I'm not sure if you touched on it because I, I arrived very late. Mm. But too often, I hear a very poor English, poor pronunciation, poor 
written English in the press. So I'm going to give you some examples. Fa fauna, fauna, flora and fauna pronounce, pronounces fa fauna. Mm -hmm. I find everybody is myself in. Everybody is myself. And I, I wonder, what about the pronouns me? I, you, they, everybody is myself in themselves in their self in. The other word, the other concern is there are certain, there is certain language that is French. For example, one can say, much ado about mm -hmm. nothing. Dr. Leacock knows what I'm speaking about. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people say, what should you? You know, one is French, A-D-I-E-U, right? Another thing, to be quick, <laughs> everybody, persons. There are 100 persons. What happened? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I can what I, happened to the word people? Can I, can I, can I, can I stop Let you right Let me have now? my seat. Yeah, can I? Can but I you get my point. Yeah, I, I get so your point. So my point is really yeah. how well-trained are journalists. You talk yeah. about Grammarly. You yeah. can't go to Grammarly unless you know proper yeah. grammar. Yes. Subject, verb, yeah. Yeah. agreement. OK, Thank you. great. I, and I, and, I, and I, I, made, I made reference to the matter of, of training uh, earlier. And you reminded me of a course that the university taught when I was there called Use of English because they realized that the, the students um, who were well versed in many other, many, many academic subjects um, really had a problem with the English language. You are true, you're right about the matter of the language usage in, uh, in the media. Um, it is a, it, it, in, in some ways, is a tragedy because we are supposed to be communicators of the highest order. Um, I remember in, in, in my rediffusion days, you couldn't, make, you couldn't even dream of making the kind of mistakes that you're talking about there because Alfred Pragnell will be behind you, um, you know, asking you clearly what you're talking about and Frank Pardo will suggest that you lose some of your bonus, etc. cetera. Um, but the, the, the language is a problem and it's not just for the media, it's across, it's, it's, it's across the entire society. Um, you, you raised one of my favorite ones. Everybody's, everybody talks about persons, and I said, but what happened to people, for instance? Um, so we have, I will only say to you that there are training opportunities. One, uh, the institutions that I refer to, the university has a number of platforms for teaching, um, and there are, the, there, are the, there are the schools in private sector, etc. But the biggest, the biggest resource we have available to us is on the internet and it doesn't cost any money. And you have Coursera and all these other people offering free courses, and language has to be primary. We have to get our language right. Um, otherwise, you know, we, we're really wasting our time. So to be, to be good communicators, and I'm, it's a pity that I didn't get the Trevor, Trevor um, McDonald piece to go, because he makes that point as a journalist where communication requires us to have the highest levels of skill because the general public, which is the point I always make, the general public does not accept that Julian Rogers does not know Patagonia and whatever else. They expect me to be the brightest person in the world. And, you know, and the only way to achieve that is really for what my father talked about, continuous learning. And I say the tools are available, the resources are available, and there is no excuse for you not to get your language skills right. And you have a lot of, of human beings available. You don't just need AI now. You have a lot of human beings around you who can help. All right, so we have our penultimate question down here. Thank you very much. Um, Julian, thank you for your tremendous presentation and for laying the foundation for myself and hundreds of others to get into this particular career. A very brief, how important is local and Caribbean content <laughs> versus the seemingly strong presence continually of international fear on all okay. the platforms. Okay. And then, and then um, secondly, we chase the revenue, but what is the moral responsibility of all the agencies who are involved in information, entertainment, and education? Okay. Let me, I'm, I'm glad you raised that. I, I made this very quick. Um, you, see, you see the rediffusion model? The rediffusion model exists today in that we are in the position 
sorry, we are relaying constantly all kinds of content from the rest of the world. And we, we spend time putting it together in the paper and on the air and on TV, and we go and say, oh, um, um, I'm Julian Rogers, and we've got the local, regional, and international news. I'm saying, but hold on, Barbados is in the Caribbean. So, so we're not part of the regional news. That's the first thing to fix. The international news, we spend a lot of time relaying everybody else's focus on the news. But we don't address the fact of where we fit in this international news mix. So we need to tell the international news from our perspective. In other words, those things that are relevant to us and are on our interests, that's what we should report in the international. Now, that then frees us up to concentrate on what is our national news, what is our thing. And I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. I'm suggesting, for instance, that journalists tomorrow go online, no, go tonight, go now, go to the United Nations uh, Development Goals, Sustainable Development Goals, take every one of those, pull out of every one of those an area that you should focus on in writing news for the next year. Well, for the next seven years, for that matter, because we, we target into 2030. You will have news every day, because if you take goal number one about poverty, you can write stories and get stories about poverty in Barbados, in Trinidad, Jamaica, Grenada, wherever the case may be. If, and if you write the Barbados story, you can share it with the journalists in Jamaica, and immediately we will get a compilation of the poverty situation in the Caribbean, produced by journalists. It's work for all these young journalists that, that in training, etc. Take all of that. That's, that's one platform I suggest you go and use right now, that you will have all your local news so that you won't just be preoccupied by putting the crime story that just happened last night where 14 people get killed overnight. Yes, you have those stories to write, but you're going to give the public a diet that is far more enriching of understanding where we are and what needs to happen. So people with money, seeing the poverty story that you write, can say, well, hold on a minute. I used to give the Salvation Army $100, but based on the work of the Salvation Army in providing meals on wheels, and they say their budget is a million dollars this year, I have the wherewithal to give them $20,000 every month for the next whatever the case may be. So you can apportion your support for the poverty alleviation campaign. You're not waiting for the government. Yeah, the government has a responsibility, but as a citizen of this country, you can make an, you can make an input. Education is there. You see the food first agenda, the, the, the um, food security agenda? It's everybody's business, we're gonna starve. So why not the media set up a campaign to encourage people to do kitchen gardens and have a competition and go to Carter's and say, Carter's, will you sponsor this? <coughs> so you're making money, but you're also providing a service. If you take every one of those areas, you will find support. The fertilizer people, everybody who's involved in food production and consumption, etc. Go to all the hotels and tell them, we want your chefs to appear in a series of shows on television showing how to use current produce available in Barbados that would be right in dishes for school children, for adults, for old people, etc. These are ideas that are right there in terms of developing content. So if you go down that road, I don't have to answer the second, the second question you pose. So I have to apologize to the online community. There were questions there, but we really take, are take at one, our time take limit. One, take, take one question. Take one. two. <laughs> don't, don't. Take two from the online people. Oh, gosh. This, I'm not going anywhere, you know. My flight is Monday morning back to Jamaica. Oh, well, I think the, the, the one question was asking, what do you see as the relationship between academia and the media? Ah, that perfect. Was the Quick one. Question. When I... When I started doing television, morning tele I introduced morning television in Trinidad back in 1995. It was at the, at the start of an election campaign, which would, was held in uh, either late November, December, some, anyhow, whatever the case may be. 
we were the only television station that did what we did, which was we interviewed Trinidad had about 95 parties, huh? So our job was how to get all these people on the air. So I managed to, to anyhow, we went through all this and anything. Our competitors at the time were at TTT, the government-owned television station. And I got a report saying, all oh, the people at TTT said, boy, you're doing a fantastic show, but wait till the election's over, you ain't got one damn thing to do. You ain't got nobody to interview, etc." Aha, you can not tell Julian Rogers things like that. I have friends in the university. So I drive up to St. Augustine, go and find um, Gibbons from the Creative Arts Center. I said, Gibbons, here's the picture. He said, Rogers, I can help you. Gibbons, um, the guy who was head of the, of the social sciences department at the time, uh, and, uh, and uh, this lady who got killed, it, she was a lecturer in the law school. Um, oh gosh, oh Lord of mercy. Anyhow. So the university responded to my appeal when I said, guys, I need people to come on the show who will address the development issues of Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean. No problem. Those people went on. In fact, the president of the republic, Noor Hassan Ali, when I went to the Sringen of Basdeo Pande and, and so on that day, Call me out. Julian Rogers, you're summoned to the presence of the president. I, the, the broadcast has finished and I'm busy trying to take off my earpiece and things like that. And the engineer, engineer said, Mr. Rogers, you heard that? You heard that? The president wants to see you. I'm ushered into the president's presence. Presence. And he says, Mr. Rogers, I'm so happy to meet you. Every morning, I come downstairs. I get my coffee, I turn on the TV, and I watch Morning Edition. You have introduced me to more people in Trinidad that I was not aware of. You know what he did? He started appointing independent senators, which was his right, from among the resource people who appeared on television from the University of the West Indies. I am saying to you that the media has an opportunity to to partner with all the universities and colleges in the Caribbean because that is where the expertise is now and in the future. And I appeal to the politicians, please give the intellectuals an opportunity to weigh in on the development challenges and not accuse them of being political animals and whatever else and so on. Their time for politics will come. I made this point to Prime Minister Dr. Rowley in an interview that I did last July, I said, you, are, you, you politicians have been scaring off the intellects from saying exactly what should be said about various aspects of our country. We, we educate them, therefore they are giving back by giving their expertise to our countries. Let them speak. Let them say, you can disagree with them. No, wrong, nothing wrong with disagreeing with them. But be courteous in the disagreement. Don't abuse them off and, 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 and think they have family and they have feelings and whatever else. But you don't educate people and then tell them that they're, 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 they're dumb, stupid, and whatever else. We need, we need to send that message. And that message not, is not just to politicians, it's to other people as well. We must be in an environment of a sharing of ideas if we are to move forward in our, in, in, in our countries. We cannot be abusing off everybody, etc. This is not America. Let them go on with their damn foolishness. We, have, we, we, we were brought up with manners and brought up see, in, in, in our Caribbean, etc. Respect is due. So on that note of the environment of sharing ideas, I just want to alert you to the two further installations in this Legacy Lecture series. We will have one on Monday, November 20th at 7 p.m. She wants to go home. In the three W's Oval with Dr. Michelle Gittins speaking on the topic of women in technology, an elusive target and a missed opportunity in the Caribbean and beyond. And then on Wednesday, November 29th at 7 p.m., this time in the Cave Hill Law Faculty Lecture Theater, Mrs. Nicole Foster will be speaking on a legacy of excellence, charting new paths for the future. And it's at this point I want to turn over the, the podium to Dr. Nikisha Dawkins, who will give us the vote of thanks.
for this evening. Protocols already have been established. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to thank the guest speaker, Mr. Julian Rogers, for taking us on this very excellent historic journey through Caribbean media. Um, this was a very intriguing, engaging, and enlightening presentation. And we look forward to finishing those partially told stories when the book comes out. <laughs> Second, I would like to thank the 60th Anniversary Committee, specifically the chair, Dr. Henderson Carter, and the secretary, Ms. Toika Ford, Okay, the Nation Publishing, our partners in these lecture series, the UE Credit Union, Markham's Marketing and Communication, the chair for this evening's event, Dr. Nicola Hunt, the UE Security Guard for providing us with their services, and uh, Caribbean Cuisine. <laughs> <laughs> for providing us throughout these legacy series with their very tasty and delicious um, selection of food items, including wines and juices. And you will get to partake in this as soon as I'm done with the vote of thanks. So last but not least, thank you to the audience, ladies and gentlemen, for coming out this evening. Good night.